Uh, we had a little bit of a, a snafu earlier. Is it? We had a bit of a snafu earlier, and we didn't get our uh, uh, vendor table out and everything. So we're just going to do a vendor pitch instead, just so. We Anyways, uh, marketing put together like this real nice buzzwordy deck for me. And uh, if you've ever seen me speak before, you know that's not really how I fly usually, but it was real important because, Craig, this is for you. If they don't, uh, they'll be very furious with me if Craig doesn't get a photo of, of me talking and uh, get that out on, on the Mastodon and whatnot. So anyways, something that we have learned over the, over the last uh, forever years is that DevOps and config management and like now platform engineering and everything else, it's, it's, it's all about communication, collaboration. Uh, like it's this shared language in which different teams, different people, all the different people on all the different teams, it's just how they communicate to uh, effectively get shit done. So in Puppet's been right there enabling this collaboration right there from the beginning. We've been right here in Ghent for shit like a decade now. Um, and honestly, we're all super glad to see back, uh, to be back here, I'm going to use Adam's phrase here, seeing all your motherfuckers' faces again. Um, so we've got a new logo, <laughs> slightly new logo now. You may have heard that uh, particular news. But the interesting part is just that now we fit into a larger portfolio of uh, DevOps tooling, automation tooling, and this lets us focus again on the things that make Puppet great in the first place. So, have a great time at the conference. Um, like I said, we had a little mix up with the swag, so it might be hard to find us. But stop by and say hi. We're around. Okay. Who does not know what an Ignite is? That makes it easier for me. Um, we're moving two Ignites from today to tomorrow. Um, one schedule conflict and somebody who's not feeling too well. Let's hope she's back tomorrow. But apart from that, who wants to go first? Alessandro, or Lander, or Brian, or Nicholas, or Philip? I lost the OK. The Italians won. Nesta cut it for. Quick. Let's. Are you ready? Sort of. Sort of. So, yeah, I'm Alessandro Franceschi, and I'm here to talk about Tiny Puppet, this tool which can install everything. And I'm going to challenge you on this statement. Uh, what is Tiny Puppet? It basically is a puppet module. Every puppet module, when you talk about puppet, has some features which you expect from it. Should be the well documented, reusable, tested, it's important, uh, support multiple operating systems, optimize it for performance, and maybe even have uh, bold tasks. And typically, one module has uh, and manages one application and only that application. Well, Tiny Puppet is all these things, uh, but actually, it doesn't manage just one application. Tiny Puppet is able to manage every application. And we are going to see quickly how. Uh, you can install it with Puppet module install example for 2 tp and once it is installed, you can use it to install every application as we saw. I'm telling this for years, really, but actually there is something new this year which I'm going to present you, is how you can install uh, these many different applications on every different operating system, in every way. Using native host packages, using upstream repositories, downloading the release tarballs and binaries and then getting the, the binary in your file system, compiling from source code via a Docker image. All these different uh, installation methods are now possible with Tiny Puppet. And you can also configure your applications with Tiny Puppet as code, as data, taking care quickly and easily uh, how to configure many applications, different applications with just one module. You can use it also to manage full directories of your applications, also maybe with contents taken from a Git uh, source. Here is an example of data you can use to define two directories related to the different applications with the contents you want. And that's not all, actually, with Tiny Puppet, you can do a lot of other things which are all related to it. For example, test. Whatever you install with Tiny Puppet can be tested easily with a command line or a bold task in a CI-CI pipeline on demand via monitor tools and so on. Whatever you install can be easily automatically tested. You can also troubleshoot it 
TP log, your application, you see the logs of application. TP info, you see info about the application. TP debug, to get deeper in, uh, in the application, and maybe even get the source code. TP source, your application name, you download the source code of the application, eventually you have it at disposal. And all this is possible as Puppet code, via YAM data, via the command line, or via bolt task. So tiny puppet is many different things that can manage every application in these different ways. So for example, if you talk about data, the higher data which we can use to configure different applications in different ways, installing them in different ways and so on. That's it, that's what you need, that's what you can do with tiny puppet. If you want to use it as data. Of course you can have multiple options. And you may wonder how you can do this, how is it this possible uh, magic things? Well, it's all about tiny data. Tiny data is the data which defines all the things about our applications and is used by Tiny Puppet. But tiny Puppet 4 is going to be released soon with that tana tiny, tiny data format which is in this uh, shape. Version 4 is, looks like this. For, to define everything about an application, I just need to write something like that. And it's quite easy, actually. I can manage and create the support for many different applications in very quick time. So that's my challenge here, sorry guys. I challenge you to make me install any application you want on any operating system you want in any way you want with Tiny Puppet. Open a ticket somehow on GitHub, going to come the references, and I will try to manage it with Tiny Puppet as soon as I can. If I fail, I offer you a beer sometime in some space time. <laughs> if I deliver, please talk, use it. I mean, I did the effort to try to, run, to use this command to install your application in your operating system. So all this is coming up with the Puppet 4, uh, Tiny Puppet 4. Uh, all these data about fee packages and applications can be used for different things, like packaging, for example, images with this application and with your configurations. But this is something which I will tell you about sometime sooner or later. So the whole point is, even if you don't like, if you don't know anything about Puppet, you can use Tiny Puppet as a tool, a command line. So Puppet is the language, you don't care about it. You don't need a Puppet infrastructure. You can use TP, the command, to install from the command line, straight ahead, every application. TP install sysdig, you get a sysdig with the repository upstream, and that's it. TP install crowdsec, you install a crowdsec on Debian, Ubuntu, Red Hat, Darwin, and so on. Everything else can be managed as data, so that's the next step, too quick to go, but TP desktop is another feature of Tiny Puppet which allows you to configure your desktop in simple YAM files. Give it a try because it could be quite useful. So that's it, five minutes, it's all his fault uh, because he gave me just five minutes to talk about uh, this thing. Feel free to try it, challenge me on tiny data. Thank you for listening. I was about to say Brian has a challenge for you, but Nicholas wants to go first. <laughs> Did I just drop all the meal vouchers? Are you ready? Too many people. <laughs> Too many people, okay. This is committee. Good luck. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I will start with a question. Who has already heard of Rudder here? <coughs> okay, solid quarter. So we've made a survey to learn about our users, what they do with Rudder, uh, what they like about it, what they don't like about it, what they would like to be changed. We've made a survey started on the 29th of December, uh, probably not a good idea, retro retrospectively. Sorry, I'm French. We sent a link by mail and by social media, and we got not very good results. Uh, the mail was only opened by 200 people, not much impression on Twitter, uh, so we got only 50 people who started to fill the survey and only 14 who went to the end. The reviews, um, we cover the demographics and the statistics of the users, what they use with Rudder, and what we learned with this survey. I will complete it with customer from data that I know, uh, data from customers. So most of the users who answered the survey have been using Rudder for a long time, more than one year or more than five years, using in the team 
in the world team, uh, in the world IT department, or by themselves. This uh, small company, large company, medium company, the same uh, percentage, mainly in IT services of soft software publisher, we are more, uh, we know more of people in industry and large company, so that's a bit surprising for us. It's an operational, uh, operation-based tool, uh, so mainly people from operation or DevOps, but we have a bit of security management, the green arrow. It means that the security teams are catching up with Rudder, and it does match our customers. In Rudder, we measure the compliance of the systems. Most are compliant, except one who is as average compliant, but are, is using disconnected systems, so systems not online are not compliant. We measured the infrastructure complexity with the number of groups. So in Rudder, you have nodes that you manage. You group them based on their inventory. The more nodes, the more complex is your infrastructure. Uh, it's quite medium. And the maturity of configuration. So we can measure it with the techniques. Techniques are like playbook in Ansible. Uh, so the more techniques, the more things you manage. We have some who are using a lot of techniques, even with a small number of nodes, like uh, 125 techniques for 500 nodes, which is pretty good. Rudder is mainly used for configuration management, but also for provisioning and deployment. And we see in the results that two, uh, all but two are using Rudder for either patch management or hardening, which does confirm that moving to security is a good idea. Uh, Everybody are using feature for uh, configuration management. So the rules, the directives, that's a good idea. Uh, a good point for our tool. Dynamic groups to manage the infrastructure. Everything else is not very used. So why did they choose Rudder? People choose Rudder for compliance or because they wanted, they didn't want to learn a new language. Everything could be done in web interface. The agent is light. One was honest because the boss chose the soft. What do they like about Rudder? They like that it's easy, that we have a web interface where you can do everything. They like the community support. They like the Rudder team. It was free text. They choose what they answer. They like the reporting, the building techniques, the stability over time, that it doesn't break when it upgrades. They would like to change the price of the subscription because it's too expensive for small companies, they said. They would like a marketplace place to exchange their techniques, make everything config as code, uh, automated upgrade of Rudder, and more examples. They also would like uh, some more broad features, so support for offline uh, systems, exporting CSV, uh, export by CSV for everything, make compliance more explorable, uh, dashboard for guests, etc. So what we learned is the survey was not very interesting for, for users. They didn't feel it a lot. Probably it was too long. There was no reward. It was sent after Christmas. Probably not the best time. They have the same use case a, as our customer, which is quite good. Rudder is liked for its is, ease of use and web interface. <coughs> People love the support for the community, and the customer give us the same feedback. And they like that it's reliable. So we have the same feedback as for users. And which is good? Uh, what is good is they want Custo uh, compliance export, we start to have that in the next version of Rudder in March. They would like to explore compliance. We have that in 8, uh, coming in September. Do infra as code the same in 8.0 is in, eight zero in September. And uh, we have a lot of talks about Rudder uh, during this session. If you want to, to learn more, you can come and attend at any of these talks. Thank you very much. Brian, you have five minutes to talk about nothing. Uh, Nix. Uh. Nix? My first cassette? Yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, hi, I'm Brian. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Tweak, and I do teach a university college course. Uh, so I thought this would be fine. The only thing I didn't realize was that it's 10 times bigger than, yeah. So I'm a bit stressed, but that's fine. Who here has, who here has heard about Nix? Oh, wow. OK, so I don't need to say anything. Just explain it to each other, please. Um, no, so if you don't know what Nix is, Nix is quite an 
overloaded term, in my opinion at least. You're going to hear it being called out as a package manager, as a language, as an operating system, as an entire package set, maybe even one of the best in the world at this moment. And you're going to see this logo everywhere when you Google for Nix. It's a snowflake composed of lambdas, which if you know something about functional programming is great because we love lambdas. And this is what I just talked about. It's the fact that, well, Nix is an overloaded term. You have the operating system, and the operating system is not the language, but it's still part of Nix. And language is not part of the package manager, but it's still part of Nix. Package manager is not part of the operating system, it's still part of Nix, but the pa Nix package is missing. So what does the package manager side of it look like? Well, not so different actually than most others, except that it can do a few tricks that I'm not showing here, so you come to my other talks later. I don't have Terraform installed. I do an X command, I have Terraform installed. The language is being described as JSON with functions. At the top, we have JSON. At the bottom, we have Nix. The only difference is, well, the top one doesn't have functions. The bottom one on the second line where I said love Nix, that's a function. It's not just a plain data type. And then the operating system. Well, wouldn't it be great if we, the things that we learned from the language, from the packages that we built, how about we just build an entire operating system with it? And that's exactly what Nix OS does. So here you can see I just enable HTTPD, <coughs> and that's about it. So why do we Nix? Well, I can't answer that for everybody. I do know I can answer that for myself. So I'm a proud, um, I used to use Arch, by the way, user. Um, I don't anymore, because a little bit about myself and, and you know, background. Is I used to be an embedded software engineer. I used to do embedded development. I meant a lot of embedded Linux, a lot of drivers, a lot of custom kernel modules, a lot of kernel patches as well, and a lot of just bare metal real-time, hard real-time stuff. And this was me when I was still handsome. And you can see I used a lot of different tools. I, I tried out, I jumped between a lot of different tools. I just like playing with it. And the big problem is, well, since I was playing so much and trying so many things out, it would catch fire from time to time. And my problem with Arch, and this is not a, you know, a hit at the Arch community, not at all, amazing people, it's just the fact that I didn't know how to recover from that. I made mistakes, it would blow up in my face, and things would break. Fast forward a few years, I start using NixOS. And not, not much changed, right, except for the operating system on my machine. Still used many tools, still tried a lot of things, still did custom kernel patches, and well, from time to time, things would still catch fire. Nothing changed in that department. NixOS doesn't magically solve all your problems. It's not a be all and all solution, definitely not. But it can do some pretty cool things. And one of those things is, well, the fact it knows what it used to be. So instead of browsing the Arch Wiki for three days in a row and trying to figure out how I could solve this thing and then eventually ending up on some obscure uh, kernel mailing list. I just do Nixos rebuild rollback switch and I am back to old operations just the way it was before. I can tinker with my system again and all that took was a simple reboot and in group I get a nice entry from the day before. I can go back and everything works and I don't have to stop any of my work. So my workflow has tremendously improved. So if you're interested and you might want to try this Nix thing out, well, there's a few ways to do it. And yes, the next slide is going to be horrible. And I know some of you will blame me for it. But that is the way that it's advertised on the website. So yes, we do pipe into Bash. I am terribly sorry. <laughs> we are working on a fix for that, but many fixes for it. Well, some of us will fix that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so. Yes, I know, don't pipe into Bash, but it's something that we do currently to install it. And then you can write your Nix code, run Nix shell, and you get this nice fancy Nix shell. By the way, something you might have noticed, this is the thing at the top, it's just in a .nix file. I can push that into Git, and all my colleagues that have Nix installed, just run Nix shell and have the exact same environment as I do, or almost exactly the same. And if you need help, we have an amazing community of contributors. There's a Matrix channel, there's an unofficial Discord channel, there's a forum. Head over there, ask questions, we are more than happy to answer. And if you want more, I myself am giving another talk today as well about a gentle introduction where I get 10 times the time. <coughs> and also, um, Ivan is going to give a talk tomorrow about you know, how to generate Docker images with Nix. Thank you for listening.
Ich nehme mit. Uh, Lander or Philip Mel Lander is already standing up. I'm not sure Lander is going to talk about what he did this morning, <laughs> but he's going to talk about Q. All right, so uh, I'm Lander. Hi. Um, and uh, Ignite I'm giving is inspired by two things. One, wanting to try to play around with Q and uh, being a bit fed up with uh, maintaining Terraform code. Because like, the classical way to do it is like you, know, you have a workload for every environment you have or whatever. And then you make some modules and then you have to add variables and juggle around counts to make it conditional and stuff like that. And it's, it's just a pain in the ass. Um, but Terraform as HCL, but it also can accept JSON because everything that you can do in HCL, you can represent in JSON. And the nice thing about that is that Q also generates JSON. Just take uh, it. Take it. Okay. So, um, uh, what does that mean? Like, if we can somehow link Q and Terraform together, um, that means we can have all the nice features uh, that Q has. Uh, and just use it to make Terraform code, pretty much. So you can add the constraints and, and uh, like simplify the maintenance because you can just define your application once and then um, for the different environments, just change the only what you, um, what you actually need to change, only the difference. So uh, what do we need? This is how uh, the, the, the Terraform JSON sort of looks like. So you have a resource block and then just uh, add some resource types and give them a name. It's obviously uh, a little simplified, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much the gist of it. And then you uh, define your providers and define the Terraform version and all that, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's basically just a JSON representation of the HCL code. Um, so let's get started. Uh, if you define something like this, um, the, the some kind of macro where you can then define all the, the constraints and all the common stuff uh, you want every AWS instance to have. And then you just loop over them and uh, generate the, the queue for it. Um, so once you've defined this for all the types of um, resources you want, uh, then you can just instantiate all those and um, all the other common stuff will be added to it. So actually, if you look at it, it's Syntactically, pretty similar to ACL, uh, but yeah, just in a key flavor. Um, so this is all pretty basic stuff. Um, yeah, and then we do the same for the provider block. Uh, again, obviously simplified because um, yeah, you need more than that to uh, to configure uh, the provider. Um, Waiting for the next slide, <laughs> um, and then the same thing for the for the Terraform uh, configuration. Um, so, uh, what you can do then do is um, have a, a different subfolder for every environment or every region or cluster or whatever you want, and just only change the the, the actual configuration that's that differs um, between those. So, for example, we have a folder US East. Uh, and just put in that and um, do the same for uh, EU West, uh, whatever. And it's only the, 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 the actual difference that we need to define again, and all the rest will, will get merged in, into the final JSON uh, blob. Um, so how do we generate that, that JSON? Well, we can define a command in queue. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, it just takes all the all the uh, resources and all the providers and stuff like that, dump them into a JSON file and, uh, and, and writes that to disk. Um, so this will apply every, the exact same uh, instance set on every region, but of course you can, you can uh, do whatever you want because it's queued. Um, and you can also like, um, add the, the actual execution of Terraform into the queue command. But there's a little some quirks about the, the, the Terraform CLI that doesn't make that that easy, and like, spoiler you should probably just run it from CI job anyway. So um, 
Yeah, you can also like turn it upside down, and, and uh, instead of defining the the the, um, the what's it called the the actual uh, environments in the subfolders, you can also do that for instances uh, the other way around. But it's just whatever you can imagine, because everything you can do in Terraform can be represented in JSON, and everything you can do in JSON, well, ev everything you can do in JSON, you can do in Q. So. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And if you want to learn more, uh, you should probably just ask Marcel or go through the, the uh, tutorials on the website. Thanks. Is it web scale? Is it web scale? So, is it web scale? Who remembers that video? We are old, right? <laughs> Maybe you don't really remember anymore, but this came out more than 12 years ago, so we are definitely old. For those who are not as old, um, this is the link to the original video, and it's basically somebody using MySQL and being very convinced that MySQL is the right choice, and this is unironic. And the other one is a MongoDB fan and always responds to everything with, but is it web scale? which was the slogan that MongoDB had been using back there. And I was thinking back, like, where did this is it web scale coming from? And it looks like it came back from when Twitter and Facebook were starting to become big and everybody so thought they had to scale like Google. And back then, web scale was a thing. And since we seem to be going back in time, where Twitter is going closer to this again, I thought, why not try to bring back web scale as a term and look like how it's going? Um, if this is even web scale or where we are going with that. So, what is web scale today? And I'm slightly cheating here, I'm using this slide twice. Um, obviously the one, the main thing in web scale is that it scales, but people try to put all kinds of other terms into web scale. It's like all the things or attributes that you would want to have in your system, you back then at least said like this is what is web scale and what you want to have in there. So if it should be available and reliable and it should fail over transparently and it's performant and inexpensive, all of those are part of that web scale experience that one people wanted to have. And MongoDB, always being better at marketing than engineering, picked up that slogan and then ran with is it web scale and that worked pretty well for them for some degree until people got kind of annoyed with that is it web scale and somebody made this website which is still up with which is is MongoDB web scale and the answer is no and they also say it's a stupid term and I'm like I'm not sure if web scale itself is a stupid term or if it just has been abused so much uh, but what can we make of this um, and people were turning that into memes and my interpretation by the way is that the, the person in the orange shirt is amused and just laughing at the irony of MongoDB being web scale um, and not the bliss of MongoDB but that might depend on your point of view but MongoDB again being better at marketing than anything else actually turned this into a thing like only a few years ago they turned this into a shirt and you can see in the sleeve up there this is an official MongoDB shirt so you could get that from them and they are still running with that to some degree um, but you can still beat it. For example, DevNow, it's schemaless, it scales, it's highly available, it's web scaler. Um, so maybe we should start using web scaler as a term. But on a, on a more, well, unironic way of use, like, did anybody in the last year, let's say, use web scale unironically? Okay, I'm, I'm not disappointed, I, I kind of like this is what is expect, ex expected, I guess, because it's just like faded out of everybody's existence. Uh, but what is the new term that we're using for web scale instead today? What is everybody using nowadays for, what has replaced web scale as a term? Yeah, my, my take is this one, that everybody does cloud native microservice architectures, um, because for me, that, that as a term, it's even worse, but this is what we're all talking about. Who has used this in the last year? Yeah, that's yeah. way more. So this is really a thing, and you can easy, also see it in the, the web trends, uh, that microservice and cloud native, uh, those are the terms that you have to use, so web skill is maybe out of the window. Uh, so 
I'm not sure this is an improvement because for me it's kind of like some of the similar gist. And the question is, should we return to web scale because as a term I think it's actually kind of nicer. <laughs> Anybody feel strongly about returning to web scale? No. Yeah, so I, I, I tried to, to look that up and the first hit that I, was, I got yesterday on Twitter was this one. And then it was officially dead for me. <laughs> because we really cannot use web scale unironically anymore. Um, this is what you get, it's dead. Also, um, there is a company, webscale.com is a thing, also unironically. Um, so it's really, irony is dead. Um, we can banish the term, uh, never to be used again. And you know, there's only one way to say it, um, how to never use that term again. <laughs> This way, say web scale one more time. Um, this is, I, I'm afraid, where we have ended up with that. Um, but as a conversation starter, it's still great if anybody brings an architecture to you and you ask, but is it web scale? Thanks a lot. And I tried to take a picture with you so I can prove to my colleagues that I've been working today. Thanks a lot.